In the early days of the Persian Gulf War, a captain, H.R. McMaster, found his unit of nine M1 Abrams tanks, 13 M3A2 Bradleys, and 120 troops squaring off against dozens of Soviet-era tanks, armored vehicles, and hundreds of Iraqi infantry forces. Over the span of just 23 minutes, McMaster's Eagle Troop laid waste to the dated T-72 and T-62 tanks Iraq was using. And as luck would have it, those are the same tanks Russia's putting into the fight today. Let's talk about what happens when you pit the Abrams against this kind of dated Soviet armor. I'm Alex Hollings. Welcome to Firepower. With 31 M1 Abrams main battle tanks now headed for Ukraine, there's been a great deal of discussion about how these armored behemoths will fare against the Russian tanks that they were originally designed to square off against. Of course, this isn't the first time the American Abrams will find itself sighting in on dated Soviet armor, and few interactions better reflect this power mismatch than the legendary Battle of 73 Easting from the Persian Gulf War. The Battle of 73 Easting is often referred to as one of the great tank battles of the 20th century. With just nine M1A1 Abrams main battle tanks, 13 M3A2 Bradley fighting vehicles, and 120 American soldiers squaring off against a much larger force hailing out of the well-trained Iraqi Republican Guard and 10th Armored Divisions. To make matters worse for the numerically inferior American forces, the Iraqi troops and armor were embedded in a defensive posture, just waiting for their chance to sink their teeth into the as-yet-unproven American tanks. When the fighting began, however, a combination of sound military strategy employed by a then 28-year-old H.R. McMaster and superior military technology laid waste to the Iraqi forces, proving unequivocally that the one-two punch of M1 Abrams main battle tanks and M3A2 Bradley fighting vehicles were more than just effective in the fight. They were downright devastating. But before we dive into what happened in the Battle of 73 Easting, we first need to temper our analysis with some appropriate context. The Persian Gulf War was a massive military operation led by the United States and supported by a coalition of some 35 other countries. With more than 3,100 M1 Abrams tanks in the region, America's gas-guzzling turbine-powered Abrams benefited from the massive logistical might of the U.S. and its allies, while operating with airspace overhead that was dominated by coalition fighters. Now, all that matters all the more when we're talking about the capabilities of the Abrams specifically. I mean, this tank famously requires around 10 gallons of fuel just to start up, and it burns through between 2 and 10 gallons of fuel for every mile that it covers, depending on how it's being operated. America's M1 Abrams main battle tanks were designed specifically to counter advanced new tanks being fielded by the Soviet Union in the 1970s with a European war in mind. But they were also designed to be operated by the wealthiest nation on the planet with a robust global supply chain. In other words, the Abrams is a technologically advanced war machine that works best when used by a nation with mountains of cash to burn and the air superiority required to maintain hardy supply lines. Now, Ukraine has neither the cash nor the air superiority to leverage the Abrams in the same ways America might. But the technological edge provided by the venerable American armor might still be enough to help the embattled Ukrainian forces just lay waste to the dated Russian tanks that are currently headed for the fight as we speak. Believe it or not, we're now four decades since the original M1 Abrams started entering service, but it's managed to stay relevant thanks to a steady stream of upgrades and improvements incorporated over the years. Today's latest Abrams, the M1A2 SEP V3, is among the most advanced and capable armored systems on the planet. 
Equipped with an M256 120mm smoothbore cannon, with an M240 machine gun mounted coaxially alongside it, and another 12.7mm machine gun operated via the Common Remotely Operated Weapon System, or CROWS, it finds its targets using a next-generation forward-looking infrared optic. It carries electronic warfare systems and a variety of both active and passive defensive measures. But as advanced as today's newest Abrams may be, even the American tanks leveraged in 1991's Gulf War were technologically miles ahead of the Soviet-era T-72s and T-62s operated by the Iraqi military, and increasingly by the Russian military in Ukraine today. As such, the Battle of 73 Easting, which saw a small force of American Abrams and Bradleys square off against a significantly superior and dug-in Iraqi unit, can give us some interesting insights into just how the Abrams really does stack up compared to Russian armor in the field. So with that, let's dive into what may be one of the best American military stories of the modern era. On 26 February 1991, shortly after the invasion of Iraq began, Captain H.R. McMaster's Eagle Troop, comprised of nine M1A1 Abrams main battle tanks, 13 M3A2 Bradley fighting vehicles, and around 120 soldiers, were ordered to advance eastward toward embedded Iraqi positions. While they would normally be aided by advancing scout helicopters and air support provided by tank-busting aircraft like the A-10 Thunderbolt II, a massive sandstorm in the area not only drastically limited their visibility, but it also left American air power grounded. McMaster's orders were clear, though. Advance as far as 67 Easting, or the 67th kilometer longitude line east of the Coalition Forces Campaign Map's center line, in an effort to identify Iraqi defensive positions without being drawn into a decisive engagement. Once McMaster's Eagle Troop found Iraqi armor, they were to report their position and wait for the full might of heavy reinforcements to close in from the rear. Unbeknownst to McMaster and his men, however, they were actually just a bit north of a road running parallel to their advance, a road that stretched from east to west, and that led directly into an Iraqi military training complex, occupied by a brigade of Iraq's Tawakolna Division and elements of the 10th Armored Division both among the nation's most well-trained and well-equipped armored units. The Iraqi troops had been given orders to halt the American advance, and they dug in for a fight. I'm going to quote H.R. McMaster now. The enemy commander, Major Muhammad, and his soldiers knew the ground well. The unit had used the village for billets as they conducted live-fire training. Muhammad, who graduated from the infantry officer advanced course at Fort Benning, Georgia, thought it was an ideal ground from which to defend. The Iraqi forces may have had the advantage of fortified defensive positions, but they had made a serious tactical error. Navigating the featureless Iraqi desert usually meant having to rely on following roads to avoid getting lost. But the advanced American Abrams and Bradleys were all equipped with modern global positioning systems that allowed them to navigate freely. The unaware Iraqi commander had oriented all his defenses toward the road, but Eagle Troop was approaching from a few kilometers north of it, granting them at least some degree of surprise. But despite this mistake, McMaster spoke highly of Major Muhammad's defensive strategy. Muhammad had fortified the village with ZSU-23 Shilka radar-guided anti-aircraft weapon systems, orienting their four massive 23mm autocannons parallel to the horizon, intent on using them to tear through land-based armor instead of jets. He then placed dozens of tanks and BMPs throughout the defensive position, with hundreds of infantry troops scattered between them in bunkers and hastily dug trenches. The plan was to make the village itself a hornet's nest of defensive power, forcing the advancing American armor to scatter to the north or south of the village where he'd placed mines to stop their advance long enough for him to orient heavy fires and hopefully lay waste to the Abrams and Bradleys. He then positioned another 18 T-72 main battle tanks in a circle about three kilometers further to the east to quickly respond if the Americans managed to break through his defensive lines. Still unaware of all this, Eagle Troop pressed slowly into the raging sandstorm, with its 13 Bradleys leading the way, peering through their infrared optics as they went, and his nine Abrams following closely behind. 
Before long, they came across an Iraqi scout position, who promptly surrendered, but not before giving the Iraqi forces notice of the American advance. As Eagle Troop pressed on, they spotted two Iraqi BMPs scouting their position, accompanied by three tanks. And just like that, the fight was on. Before the Iraqi armor even had an opportunity to react, one of Eagle Troop's Bradleys halted position and opened fire with a BGM-71 tow missile, hitting the southernmost tank, and within literally seconds, that same Bradley fired a second tow missile, hitting the second tank, just before ripping into the third with its 25mm M242 Bushmaster chain gun. But while Eagle Troop's attention was oriented toward the Iraqi armor in the northeast, Iraqi soldiers holed up in a small group of secluded buildings to the southeast opened fire. McMaster quickly assessed that the structures didn't look as though they had any civilians sheltering among the attackers. He gave the order for all nine Abrams to open up on the structures with their massive 120mm smoothbore guns, ending the small arms fire just as quickly as it started. But almost immediately after that, another explosion ripped out of the ground just short of one of Eagle Troop's advancing Bradleys. Peering through his infrared optics, the Bradley commander spotted a single T-72 tank just about 800 meters ahead. He gave the order to stop as he and another Bradley both returned fire with tow missiles. In the distance, they watched as the T-72's turret popped off the tank like a jack-in-the-box a commonplace sight today in the fighting we've seen in Ukraine. And there's good reason for that. Unlike the Abrams, which stores ammunition for its main gun in a rear compartment of the turret, Russian tanks like the T-72 carry their main gun shells in what basically amounts to a ring around the turret's floor. As a result, any hit on this area of the tank can lead to a chain reaction in which all the rounds detonate, or cook off as it's commonly called, and that'll blow the turret off the tank and kill the crew inside just about every time. With four Iraqi tanks and two BMPs already smoldering, McMaster knew his fight was just beginning. Recognizing that they'd kicked the hornet's nest, McMaster called out over the radio for Eagle Troop to shift positions. Eagle Troop, battle stations, tanks lead, go to tanks lead, he called out over the radio. The 13 Bradleys slowed, and McMaster's 9 Abrams pressed ahead in a wedge formation, as orders came in over the radio for Eagle Troop to continue to move further forward, all the way to 70 Easting. Shortly thereafter, McMaster spotted the beginning of Major Muhammad's trap. Five tanks positioned next to one another, with three more in reserve a bit north of them. The laser rangefinder in McMaster's Abrams gave him a read on their distance. 1,420 yards. McMaster quickly gave the order to fire a Sabbat, a 41-pound M829A1 armor-piercing round, which carries a depleted uranium fin-stabilized penetrator that's designed specifically to make short work of enemy armor. It hit the first tank at nearly 3,500 miles per hour, and within just three seconds, McMaster's Abrams fired a second Sabbat round, wiping another T-72 off the scorecard. The remaining six Iraqi tanks all opened fire at once, raining 125mm rounds down on Eagle Troop as the nine Abrams reached the crest of a small hill. As explosions rang out around him, McMaster came to a terrifying realization. From his position at the top of this small berm, McMaster could see no fewer than 39 more Iraqi tanks, accompanied by 54 armored vehicles and hundreds of infantrymen. Despite being ordered not to become decisively engaged, McMaster's Eagle Troop was now taking fire, and they were massively outnumbered. As McMaster realized the scope of his situation, a call came over the radio from Lieutenant John Gifford. I know you don't want to hear this right now, but you're at the limit of advance. You're at the 70 Easting. Advancing any further wouldn't just be a violation of orders. It could potentially place Eagle Troop too far ahead for reinforcements to reach them in time. With a sizable enough Iraqi force, it could even mean getting his small unit surrounded. But McMaster also knew that his troops were already well within the sights of Iraqi T-72s. His choice at this point was either fight or turn tail and run. He called back over the radio. Tell them we can't stop. Tell them we're in contact and we have to continue this attack. Tell them I'm sorry. 
As explosions continued to hail down over Eagle Troop, they pressed forward aggressively, with all 13 Bradleys and all 9 Abrams firing. By the time Eagle Troop reached the beginning of the enemy lines, they'd already wiped out 15 more T-72s. The ZSU-23 anti-aircraft system opened fire with all four of its 23mm cannons, but it was quickly neutralized by one of the Bradleys firing a tow missile. Other Bradleys took on the infantry positions, opening up with their M240 machine guns and 25mm Bushmaster chain guns. Despite the American armor's superior infrared optics, the Iraqi forces were still managing to land hits. But even when the 125mm smoothbore main guns of the T-72 landed direct hits on the Chobham composite armor at the front of the Abrams, the rounds just bounced off. As Eagle Troop pressed further into the Iraqi lines, they spotted the formation of T-72s held in reserve. Their close proximity to one another made targeting that much easier, and Eagle Troop destroyed the entire formation in just a matter of seconds. Within 23 minutes, Eagle Troop had pressed all the way to 73 Easting and utterly devastated the numerically superior and fortified Iraqi positions. In all, Eagle Troop laid waste to some 47 tanks, 34 armored vehicles, countless additional trucks, and fortified infantry positions. And they'd done it all without losing a single vehicle or weapon system themselves. McMaster's small Eagle Troop had destroyed an entire Iraqi Republican Guard battalion. And the one-two punch of Abrams' main battle tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles secured their place in military history. And on that ends yet another edition of Firepower from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. I want to thank Hector Tinoco for taking over editing duties on this episode. And make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.